the Essenes embodied Jesus Christ. The story of Jesus most likely began around 100 years before the story begins, with his birth at the beginning of the Common Era. The first written version of the story is the Gospel of Mark that dates from 70 Common Era, about 40 years after the story says Jesus died. This is also the time of the Jewish revolt against Rome and the defeat and expulsion of the Jewish people from the Promised Land. The knowledge of the Hebrew Bible in a time of illiteracy indicates that the Gospel of Mark was written by rabbis, or very learned men in Judaism. Men who decided they needed to write down this story that had been circulating by word of mouth and storytelling for as many as 170 years, beginning with the founder of the Judaism sect of the Essenes, the prolific writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, to make money. Their temple, homes, and country were gone. And it was desperate times for the Jewish people. The name of the founder of the Essenes was the, with a capital T, <laughs> the Teacher of Righteousness. That was his name, the Teacher of Righteousness. Meaning, he was believed to be the man described in Isaiah 53, who makes the many righteous. The man Jesus claimed to be. According to the oral story that most likely began 100 years before the Common Era, BCE, with this man called the Teacher of Righteousness, who established the sect of Judaism known as the Essenes, this Teacher of Righteousness who fought with a wicked priest. All this information is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Fought with a wicked priest did not like the way the temple was being run, did not like all the sinning going on in Jerusalem, and did not live there, and despised riches and the material things of the world, just like Jesus, who also claimed to be the teacher of righteousness. The oral storytellers, who were diverse and from different backgrounds, ethnicity and ability, captured the imagination of the crowds with their oral skills and would earn their livelihood from donation of money and goods in the age of antiquity. Few could read in a world where literacy was restricted to just a few, and this did not begin to change until the Middle Ages. While the earliest forms of written communication date back to about 3,500 3, to 3,000 BCE, literacy remained for centuries a very restricted ability closely associated with the exercise of power. Schools in ancient Israel, if any existed, served only the sons of the rich and the religious elite. Storytellers in general would be very learned men captivating the imagination of the crowds at the gates and the meeting places of Jerusalem. With tales that people of a harsh and brutal time wanted to believe in a time when medical treatment was primitive and life expectancy was 30 to 35 years, averaging those who died at birth to those who died with long life into their 70s and beyond. A time when people believed in mythical gods and gods who were men and making sacrifices to gods for favor and for safety, healing, long life, crops, and fertility. The Dead Sea Scrolls are generally thought to have been 
produced by the Essenes. No one really doubts it anymore. And the Essenes are a group that protested the way the temple was being run. Many of the Essenes went to the cliffs in the caves east of Jerusalem by the Dead Sea, known as Qumran, to prepare the way of the Lord, following the commands of the prophet Isaiah. Today, in this day, the day of the Lord, because the land burns again, the Jewish people have returned in Jerusalem and the ruined cities have been rebuilt. Elijah clears the way for the Lord. They went to Qumran to get away from the sinning of the people of Jerusalem and the ways of the religious elite at the temple, which would have been Pharisees and Sadducees. The Essenes are never mentioned. They're never mentioned in the New Testament. Now, they are prolific writers. And they had their own gate. They had their own gate throughout the life of Jesus and for 40 more years until Jerusalem was destroyed. And that, in 70, common era, when everything was being destroyed, that's when they put those scrolls deep into pottery, a big uh, pottery, and, and, and buried them. That's what kept them uh, from uh, disintegrating into dust. And if you ever look it up, I mean, when I say prolific, they, there must have been many people, they were copyists. But they also did, well, I won't get to it. They made commentary on the scrolls. One of the first leaders of the Qumran community, again, was a teacher of righteousness identified in the Damascus document and the Habakkuk Pesher. A Pesher is a type of commentary in Hebrew. In the Pesher literature, the teacher of righteousness is presented as a founding figure who directly clashed with an opponent called the wicked priest. Of course, we all know what Jesus went through with the religious elites, Sadducees, Pharisees, and the high priest. This was the wicked priest in his day, a hundred years before the birth of Jesus. The man described in Isaiah 53 is often referred to the teacher because of verse 11, where God says, verse 11 of chapter 53 of Isaiah, where God says, my righteous servant makes the many righteous. The teacher of righteousness and his followers left a library of information on his teachings, himself, and scripture, and would seem to be the first of many men to claim or to be claimed by others that <clears throat> the man described in Isaiah 53. Jesus is not even the last. Uh, no, he's not, but I mean, he's not even the last. The Hebrew noun, Pesher, is found in the Hebrew of the Qumran scrolls in the sense of meaning, uh, explanation, interpretation. It is similar to a midrash in the Talmud. Various biblical texts were deemed prophetic and were subjected to Pesher interpretation even when appearing in non-prophetic literary context. The copy of the Pesher of Isaiah dates to the beginning of the first century common era. The Pesher of Habakkuk attributes this technique to the founder of the community, the teacher of righteousness. In other words, this Pesher is written during Jesus' life. And they had their own gate, the gate of the Essenes. The Qumran sect, like the broader Jewish movement from which it sprang, took a critical view of the established orthodoxy of its time, believing Israel to be under divine judgment, regarding itself as the true remnant of Israel and awaiting its imminent vindication. 
at the, quote, end of days. At the end of days, evil would cease, the wicked would be destroyed, and the righteous would live under a divine blessing. This is not unlike the teachings in Judaism today of a redemption, restoration, and exaltation of the Jewish people by the world of Gentiles, the nations, with peace throughout the world when the anointed one comes. The anointed one, anointed one means Moshiach. The New Testament will say Messiah. That it just means anointed to do a task for God. And that would be from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah. And the man is described in Isaiah 53 according to the sages and rabbis of the town. He was known as the leper scholar. And, and, and that's because it's a man a suffering familiar with disease. Uh, sickness that will bring you to grief and be exposed to death. Today we would say cancer. And and he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. That That's in Isaiah 53. By his knowledge. Not by his death. Not by his crucifixion. Nobody dies. Exposure to death is not death. Jesus died. He was never exposed to death. He didn't get near it, but it did not happen. This time that the Essenes were waiting upon, that they thought was imminent, did not happen for them. And it is this teaching that Jews for Judaism uses in the analysis that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as God's righteous servant, as one man, Israel. The persecution of the Essenes and their leader, the teacher of righteousness, probably elicited the sex apocalyptic visions. These included the overthrow of the wicked priest. Jesus pointed an accusing finger at the high priest and told him, You shall see me return. Oh, it sounds threatening to me. <laughs> The wicked priests of Jerusalem and of the evil people and in the dawn of the Messianic age, the recognition of their community as the true Israel. Josephus Flavius describes this sect, the Essenes. This is a man living at the time. People wrote back then. But you can't find anything written by Jesus or about Jesus until after the destruction of the temple. He describes this sect, the Essenes, as one of the main three philosophical sects among the Jews, with a very detailed description. Excerpts from his book, Wars 2, chapter 8, include, this is in quotes, the third sect, which pretends to a severe discipline. These men are despisers of riches and so very communicative as raises our admiration. And as for their piety towards God, it is very extraordinary. You would think that Jesus would have been in this thing. He fit right in. But again, we never hear a single word about these prolific writers. The other two philosophical sects were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In the New Testament, the Essenes are never mentioned, as I said. All the stories of Jesus and his clashes with the religious elite of Jerusalem in the New Testament are with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. According to this same Josephus, the name of the gate in the southern wall of Jerusalem at Mount Zion was called the Essenes Gate. Everything about the Essenes says Jesus would have been one. Peter and Paul, disciples later called apostles of Jesus, 
All said Jesus was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and the teacher of righteousness. All of Christianity does today. The Essenes, again, were writers and copyists and had their own gate in the southern wall of Jerusalem. The founding leader claimed to be the righteous servant, so did Jesus. It is impossible to believe that the Essenes had not heard of Jesus. It is impossible possible to believe they would not have gone to Jesus to question him and verify the stories around him and his claim of being God's righteous servant and write about him. Because they believed that their founder was the Moshiach and that the end times were coming. Moshiach, anointed one, described in Isaiah 53. They were great, great followers of, of, of the things Isaiah had to say, and there's a picture written on it during the life of Jesus. It's impossible to believe it. We're talking about a man that healed the sick, removed blindness, had the cripples walk, fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, walked on water, turned water to wine, raised the dead, was crucified, and three days later came back to life? And you think these people... How about Joseph Philethetus? Why, why didn't he mention that? He talks about the destruction of the temple. He was there. <laughs> the Essenes were present in and around Jerusalem for a hundred years before the birth of Jesus and another 40 or so years after his death at the age of 30 in the first written story of him and his life in 70 common era. There is not one word written by the Essenes of Jesus. There is no account in the New Testament of Jesus and an Essene. There are no writings or even a mention of him by a single person or group that was part of his generation while he was alive. There are no writings by Jesus. And prophets of God, men of God, servants of God, had been writing for him throughout the biblical times until he stopped talking to his prophets. The Hebrew Bible ended. The last prophet he spoke to, Malachi. Malachi Chapter 3, the last chapter of the prophets. Writes for God the prophetic announcement that he will return. He's going to come back. I've already talked about the five prophecies of Jesus that, of when he will return and every single one of them was false. He didn't return to his generation, sons of the, those who pierced him with the spear on the cross. He says in the Revelation on the first page, verse 7, those who pierced me with the spear shall see me return. I'm coming back quickly, quickly, quickly. Nothing was written by his disciples. There are no writings by Herod or Pilate or any Roman newspaper poem or book of this man who healed the multitudes, fed the poor, walked on water, raised the dead, turned water to wine, to wine, was crucified and rose from the dead to human life and then rose to heaven. That's where he's supposed to be returning from. While there are three gospels under the names of three disciples, they are all considered pseudepigrapha. <laughs> In Greek, that means falsely attributed. Writings which were attributed to authors who did not actually write them. And they were all written long after the death of Jesus, these Gospels, full of quotes and teachings from Jesus himself. Quoted parables, long speeches, Sermon on the Mount, long sermons, that could not be accurate if passed by word of mouth. There is only one answer. The Essenes themselves, these these writers and the storytellers of the day had put this story together. And even though the writers of the gospel knew full well these rabbis are learned men of the, of the Hebrew Bible, they, they knew 
it didn't really fit, but you know what else they knew? Nobody could verify. Nobody could check them. Nobody could check them. Now, I just did a video on um, the deceptions. The deceptive, uh, the, well, it, it covers just Matthew. And there's three different stories of him and the seats in every one of them that you can go look up now. You can verify these things that I'm saying. I'm quoting them. I give the, the chapters, the books they come from. You can see Jesus change Zachary uh, verses 9 and 10, the verses from riding an ass into Jerusalem and being crucified as Jesus said all the prophets said of him to what the prophet actually said. You can go look at it. He said he's going to go in, defeat Rome, defeat the enemy in Rome, which in Jesus' time, uh, in Jerusalem, and be, and be king of the world, which at the time would have been the nations of the Middle East. And he would tell them all to surrender. That's actually, yeah, that's, that's part of the verse itself, verse 10. And he, he would defeat the enemy and have the nations surrender and be king from sea to sea, lands into ocean. That, I mean, you can't get more deceitful than that. You can't lie greater than that. You're manipulating Scripture, God's holy word, manipulating it, deleting a verse 10, telling your disciples, you know, tell everybody these things. That's why he's telling them. Tell everybody this thing. I'm going in. They're going to kill me. Okay. That's what, that's what the prophets say. Don't forget. I mean, that's what he's doing. Jesus is a myth. Go look at it. Go look at what a myth is. Believe me, it covers the New Testament. It covers Jesus Christ. Thank you.